<laughs> say too much, don't say too little, say just enough, and then walk. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> And this will be um, in the and here we're ready to go. Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to AAC in the Cloud. I'm here to introduce Erica Prado. She's going to deliver a delightful, informative presentation on multilingual AAC with Latinx families. And I am excited for her presentation. Uh, we will be answering questions in Slack. Erica would like to answer those at the end of the presentation, but I will be recording those should you have any and she'll make sure and get to those. Take it away, Erica. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for everyone tuning in or those of you who will be um, watching this sometime later. Um, as already said, my name is Erica Prado. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm really excited to be presenting to you all what is my master's thesis project. Um, it's a project that I've been working on for um, almost two years actually. Um, so yeah, super looking forward to sharing with you all um, what I've learned so far. So the title of this presentation is how multilingual Latinx families use augmentative and alternative communication technologies, what technology developers need to know. And uh, before starting the presentation, I do want to speak a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a rising third year PhD student at the University of Chicago in the Department of Comparative Human Development. Um, my specialization is in linguistic anthropology. Um, however, my program is pretty diverse um, and, inter and interdisciplinary where I'm working and um, diving into lots of research um, areas like disability studies, science and technology studies, uh, education and a lot more. Um, but broadly speaking, my research interests include language, interaction, and autism in the Latinx community. And before the University of Chicago, I was at um, UC Santa Barbara, where I received my bachelor's in psychology and minor in sociocultural linguistics. And really how I got into this kind of work was that um, during my time at UCSB, um, I volunteered for an enrichment program for autistic youth in my hometown. And many of the participants were low income and Latinx. And it was in this program actually where, um, where I was working with the autistic youth and I was fully aware that um, all, all the people that I was working with were highly communicative, social and competent. And um, it was not reflecting what I had been told in my psychology textbooks because these individuals were very often framed as deficient. And so this led me to my research and in supporting the efforts to challenge these uh, deficit-based ideologies of autism in communication and in collaboration with autistic youth and their families. Um, and some limitations of this study is, is coming really from my own um, personal background. Um, while I am a bilingual Latina, I, I use both English and Spanish on a day-to-day -day basis, I am non-autistic and I heavily rely on speech to communicate but I am dedicated to ensuring that my research is highly collaborative with the autistic youth and their families to ensure that they are being represented on their own terms. And actually, I first wanna begin this presentation by thanking everyone who helped me during this project. Um, first and foremost, thank you to the families for um, their kindness and their generosity, who in the middle of the pandemic um, made time to talk to me about their, re their experiences with uh, AAC. Um, thank you so much to the organizations um, who really helped me out with the recruitment process. And thank you so much to the AAC specialists and tech developers that I um, got to know and for sharing their knowledge and expertise on the topic. Um, and thank you so much to the funders for this project who helped me financially compensate um, the families for their time. Okay, so as we know, AAC stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. Um, for the purposes of this, of this presentation, I'm actually gonna be focusing on what's referred to as um, aided AAC. So the external supports and the technologies um, that support communication practices. Um, and as we know, there's a wide range of AAC technologies, such as um, point to spell letter boards, um, a computer tablet app, uh, or a computer tablet with AAC apps installed, such as CoughDrop. Um, these can be both 
symbol based that include pictures with customizing options as seen in this image here or text based where you have um, where you can type out what you want to say. Um, some apps have both um, and both usually have some form of synthetic speech output. Um, as well as typing on an external keyboard, um, like in this image, this is Alejandra and her mother using typing based AAC. They're one of the families that I um, work with over the summer. And um, uh, I should also say that the names in this presentation are all pseudonyms. And about a, about um, a third of autistic individuals do not reliably produce speech to communicate. And so many on the spectrum, like Alejandra, turn to these devices to support their communicative needs. However, um, what I've come to learn by speaking with uh, tech developers and AAC specialists and really just me scrolling through the app store um, is that the vast majority of AAC currently on the market is designed to support English only interaction, um, leaving multilingual users very limited options in supporting their language practices. Um, for example, while some AAC apps claim that they're well suited for supporting a bilingual environment, they can often follow what is called um, one language at a time ideologies, which is um, forcing users to choosing one language or another at any given moment. And so, for example, you have your um, English board versus your Spanish board. So they're being treated as separate. Um, so the design of the technology itself can create linguistic, social and cultural boundaries um, because it's not viewed as an entire communicative repertoire. Um, so yeah, just demonstrating just one of the many ways in which um, current AAC does not always reflect the complexity of multilingualism and how multilinguals communicate in everyday life. You know, uh, many participate in what is called translanguaging practices. So using their full repertoire, not just separating languages and dialects, um, for example. And I want to make it. Um, I want to make this point here that it's particularly important to shed light on the experiences of multilingual Latinx users of AAC who are also autistic, because both the categories of multilingual Latinx and autistic are often wrongly framed as being deficient in both their language and their communicative practices. You know, one of the core features is claimed to be quote persistent deficits in social communication and. Latinx multilinguals language practices, such as the use of Spanish or translanguaging, um, are heavily stigmatized and undervalued and positioned as efficient, especially in the US context. And so by focusing on these individuals and their families and how they're navigating these devices, this can be a step toward reducing the linguistic, communicative, and culture discrimination that they face, including um, ableism connected to racism by ensuring that these forms of discrimination are not being built into and around the technologies that these families and the users themselves are using every single day. Um, you know, these families are very eager to be using these devices. It's just a matter of ensuring that um, these, these uh, families are being best supported by these technologies on their own terms. And um, a concept that I've, I've been kind of working with um, that I found pretty useful in understanding how these families are, you know, creatively adapting and negotiating with AAC to make the technologies and in interaction work for them is this concept of tinkering. You know, the concept of tinkering has been traditionally thought of as a process that happens between a person and an object and, you know, um, getting things to work. Um, and the field of human computer interaction also uses this term to characterize the practice of hacking and manipulating materials. And it's also been extended to the educational context. Um, but more recently, um, research has been expanding the term beyond objects themselves or this, you know, person object relationship, um, such as tinkering with one's own body, as well as tinkering as a form of care. But building on this broad body of work, I'm arguing that tinkering is critical to understanding how the affordances and limitations in AAC technologies reshape how people interact with an object, but also how people interact with others through an object. So my analysis first focused on tinkering with the technology and then on tinkering around the technology and its effects on communication. Um, so what do I mean by that? 
So I'm defining tinkering with as the mechanical and technical fixes and improvement made in working with the object in order for it to better align with the user's needs and goals. So something is changing. Tinkering around the object refers to the um, interactional workarounds when it's not desirable or maybe it's not even possible to make these physical changes to the object. In other words, um, people are adapting and tinker with their own interactional practices or um, behavior um, around the device to better meet their communicative needs. And so ultimately this tinkering process generates new ways of engaging in meaningful interactions in everyday life, really stressing that these effects go beyond the device itself. And so I'm arguing here that non-speakers and their family members are both tinkering with and tinkering around AAC devices, which are fundamental processes in their social interactions. So for this project, I conducted um, ethnographic interviews through Zoom with uh, five multilingual Latinx families who have a non-speaking autistic uh, family member who uses AAC. And for the purposes of this um, presentation, I was only able to include four out of the five families, but um, please let me know if you ever want to talk about that fifth family because they were great also. Um, and all of the interviews with the exception of one were group interviews and um, all were video recorded and lasted between one and two hours. Uh, most of the interviews were um, predominantly in Spanish, um, but the vast majority had some degree of both um, Spanish and English. And I was very fortunate to also um, uh, interview one family who spoke Portuguese. Um, the reason why they were also included was because I wanted to ensure that all Latinx experiences were included in this project. Um, so not having a set criteria of, of um, discriminating any language um, variety or um, any, any sort. Um, so yeah, so after uh, viewing the videos of the, um, of the interviews multiple times, um, I noted several recurring uh, themes. Um, one of them was manipulating the device to meet communicative needs. Another was inventing these creative workarounds without necessarily manipulating the device itself. Um, as well as coping with the linguistic and cultural limitations of the devices. Um, eventually noticing that in um, each of these cases, these families were working through a process of tinkering. Okay, so what does tinkering with AAC look like? Uh, in this example, I'm going to be talking about the interview I had with Valentina. She's the older sister of Jose, a non-speaking autistic Latino teenager. And it was during our one-on-one -on -one interview where Valentina and I spent time talking about a specific video clip from one of my previous research projects, which focused on the interactional competence of Jose, working through his everyday routine, specifically his uh, getting dressed routine. And it was um, in one of, one of the video clips that we were talking about, um, it showed that Jose was using his iPad AAC app, uh, Proloco to go, um, to ask um, her for pan dulce, which is, um, which I've outlined here um, on the um, image, um, which is this Mexican pastry, but um, I can actually play what it sounded like on my phone. Um, I have the Proloco to go app, so, and he uses the Emmanuel voice. Um, so I'm just going to play it on my phone. Pardos. I'm going to play that one more time. Pardos. Okay, cool. And so the iPad pronounced it kind of odd, right? It, it was pronounced with, um, it pronounced the word with the American English phonology. And so I asked Valentina what she thought about the device's pronunciation. And she laughed and she told me that she had, quote, fixed the app's button for it to pronounce Bambuza correctly. Um, meaning with the Mexican Spanish phonology, which I can also play right now. Pan dulce. Play that again. Pan dulce. Okay. Um, so, and it's important to note that um, Valentina originally installed and programmed the AAC app by herself. Um, she didn't have any AAC training from professionals. So, really highlighting a structural problem uh, with lack of training and how to use the device. And this was actually a very common issue for I spoke with. Um, 
And because of this, Jose's family spent several years with the device programmed as English only, when their home environment also includes an extensive use of Spanish and translanguaging practices, resulting in this misalignment between Jose's language practices and those of his family. And so eventually through Valentina's tinkering, she finally discovered how to set up a multilingual screen so Jose could have access to both languages simultaneously, not just one at a time, to re really reflect um, the multilingual environment of their home. So the ones that I've highlighted here in yellow are in American English phonology, and the ones in the blue are in Mexican Spanish phonology. But again, she had to figure this out on her own, and um, you know, it wasn't ready for um, Jose to use. Uh, you can see here that they've taken pictures and they've uploaded them. So it's, it's all of these other steps that they had to do in order for it to be tailored to Jose's needs. Um, so just something to keep in mind. But um, Valentina described what adding this Fun Dulce button um, to the app meant for her, but also more importantly, what she thought it meant for her brother. She says, if I can change the language for just a button, that means I can keep the English version but have, um, but have Spanish buttons because Jose is bilingual. I feel like he's bilingual. He's definitely gonna be using both languages whenever, like whatever it may be. He's gonna be using both in his life always. And so in this case, Valentina tinkers with the device to facilitate multilingualism in order for Jose to have this, um, opportunity to present himself as a bilingual person to the world. And so tinkering with AAC here is helping construct identity through language. And, you know, Jose was receptive to bilingualism before receiving the device, but now thanks to Valentina's tinkering, he could now be producing synthetic speech using the appropriate phonology for each language. And so her tinkering actively is, is reconfiguring um, Jose's way of interacting with the world, while also seeming to prioritize what she sees as Jose's communication rights, which is this right to be bilingual and use both languages in his life always. In this next example of tinkering with AAC, I'm going to be talking about Leo and his mother, Eva. Um, this is the only Portuguese um, using family that I interviewed. Um, so Leo is 11 years old at the time of the interview, and he mainly uses typing or point to spell on an external keyboard um, as a form of AAC, as you can see here. Um, in, this, um, part, in this image, it was during our interview where um, it's actually a, a Bluetooth keyboard, external keyboard, where he's typing um, on a Word document on a monitor um, behind him. Um, but interestingly, um, his family didn't know that he knew Portuguese until he started typing. Um, clinicians had told the family to not speak Portuguese to him because um, it would, quote, quote, confuse him. But he learned anyway um, through media and presumably overhearing conversations because he's being socialized into the language. Um, and so Portuguese is actually really important for Leo, as I'll describe um, a little bit later. But um, his family was really supportive of him in learning to type in Portuguese. Um, but his mom did bring up the fact that when supporting him in this journey to learn how to type in Portuguese, there did come some challenges in navigating this, um, this goal. She says, one of the challenges being in another language is you don't have the keyboards to be able to get some of your specialty keys. You have to shift and he can't shift and do that kind of thing. Uh, we're actually thinking to buy another keyboard and program it for the language because that's a big challenge if the letters you have don't work with that. And so in order to access the um, Portuguese diacritics on an external keyboard, uh, Leo would have to first hold the shift key while at the same time be pressing on the letter that he wants, which he physically can't do because of his motor difficulties. And so while Portuguese is technically available on the keyboard, um, the design itself was not accessible to Leo. And so as you know, with um, synthetic speech and, and if you're pressing, if you're typing um, one letter, uh, one wrong letter, and it could 
all go haywire. Um, you know, small inaccuracies could leave the speech sounding incoherent, uh, unorganized, and it could create these interactional difficulties. Um, but Leo did find a way to work around this issue by changing his approach to the keyboard and uh, in collaboration with others. Um, his mother actually talked about um, this creative way that he was learning to type in Portuguese. She said, um, he was using what he knew of English to try and make Portuguese words. So then my husband started asking him questions and sure enough, he started writing these answers like in this Portuguese English mix. So through this tinkering, Leo had actually figured out a way to strategically overcome the limitations of both the, te the, the technological limitations as well as the physical limitations of the keyboard by typing in Portuguese in the way that it sounded um, phonetically to him. So for example, um, one of the things his mother brought up was that Leo would, type, would, um, would spell out the, the Portuguese word for father, which is papai, as P-A-P-A-E, when it's supposed to be P-A-P-A-I. So while not receiving this formal education in written Portuguese, um, Leo was able to tinker with the device, um, meaning utilizing the resources that he had available to him to create this communication system that enabled him to communicate in Portuguese in the way that made sense for um, that made sense for his family as well as others, um, including cousins that he had in Brazil. Um, so although um, Leo's mother Eva is initially um, framing that uh, Leo is having, is, it's, it's a challenge to um, be typing in Portuguese, um, his family was able to provide a way for him to um, be supported in his developing multilingualism by co-constructing meaning with him and reading and engaging um, generously. And so also during our interview, um, as we were talking, I had asked uh, Leo if Portuguese was important to him and he answered um, by typing, yes, if I can't talk around me, Portuguese passes my thought process, like it just resonates. And so Leo's knowledge of Portuguese is really enriching his relationship with his father. You know, one of the things that is interesting about um, this quote is that he says his father can't talk around him. And that means that um, presumably that he can no longer be keeping secrets in Portuguese um, because this is a, actually a very common practice that multilingual uh, families with different um, language abilities do. Um, so Leo's understanding of Portuguese makes him a much more involved um, interactional participant and he's able to express his Brazilian heritage. Um, so being able to communicate in Portuguese was crucial for Leo because it allowed him to communicate with family members and continue to cultivate you know, very rich relationships and being able to be in those conversations because otherwise he would have not, he would have um, not been able to do so if he had not tinkered with, um, with AAC. Um, and some other issues of identity that um, were brought up in this particular interview was um, Leo's use of synthetic um, speech. Um, so his mother had told me that uh, he uses a text-to-speech app, um, didn't specify exactly which one, but um, it's on his iPad. And he um, doesn't like using um, this particular text-to-speech app. She says that he only uses it, quote, only if he has to. Um, so she told me the story about Leo's first day of school in the fourth grade where he had to create this video um, that uh, was introducing himself basically um, to his classmates. And in order to create this video, he had to use the iPad's text-to-speech app with an adult male voice. And according to Leo's mother, he was not happy about using this voice to introduce himself. And I asked Leo um, what he thought about the voice. And he said, the voice is the weirdness. It sounds like a robot. The woman's is better because it has more inflection. <laughs> Yeah, and so since this experience, um, Leo's used the woman's voice when he has to use the text-to-speech um, more often than if he, more often than the male voice because it sounds less robotic. Um, so Leo's tinkering with voices 
and he's creatively producing this speech outputs to better meet his communicative uh, needs. And so, although you, as, as we know, synthetic speech has greatly improved over the past two decades, it still can sometimes lack the rhythm and prosody of human speech. And so Leo's tinkering enables him to quote, sound human, um, which is an important way of how he wants to present himself to the world. And so Leo's tinkering with the affordances of the device, it, he, he's tinkering in this way where maybe tech developers might have not initially envisioned. Um, and it's really allowing him to construct his own identity on his own terms. And so ultimately um, this tinkering with AAC enables for reshaping ways of interacting with the social world and on his own terms. So what if you can't unlock or hack into the existing affordances built into the device? You know, what if tinkering with AAC is just not desirable or, or just not, not possible? We can tinker around. Um, again, tinkering around refers to um, tinkering with the interactional practices or one's own behavior to better adapt to the device's affordances and limitations in order to better meet uh, communicative needs. So what does tinkering around look like? Um, in this example, I'll be talking about the interview I had with 21-year-old Manuel and his mother, Gloria, and his older sister, Daisy. Um, and throughout most of our conversation, as we were chatting, um, Manuel tap, um, typed on his um, iPad AAC app um, in English with synthetic speech outputs. Um, but at one point, Manuel's mother switched the device um, to use the synthetic speech output in Spanish. And so the next time Manuel contributed to the conversation using his device, again, now using the um, Spanish speech output, um, this is what it sounded like. Again, um, the, it's the same app. Um, he uses a different voice than Jose. Um, and I'll just play how it sounded like right here. Sí, pero la quiero mucho. I'll play that again. Sí, pero la quiero mucho. Okay. Um, so when I first heard this, I actually had a pretty confused expression on my face um, because I couldn't make out what he was saying. Um, I asked him if he could repeat what he had said, uh, you know, adjusting my audio to the highest setting. And I still couldn't understand, um, even as a native Spanish speaker myself, but I was eventually made aware that he said, Si, sí, pero la quiero mucho. Again, when the speech output said, Si, sí, pero la quiero mucho. Yeah. So, um, Manuel's mother, um, Gloria, gave me a pretty nervous laugh and explained to me, oh, this, is the, this is the original quote um, in Spanish, and then this is um, the translation. So she says, the speech rate goes really fast. It's another one of those things that I don't dare to move in the settings. The English one is fine because the speech therapist left it ready, but the Spanish one, it was an American girl. Of course she didn't, and I, that's how it stayed. And so, okay, I said, oh, well. And so in this situation, Manuel and his family tinker around the device. And so in other words, they're tinkering with their own interactional practices or behavior by adapting to this fast Spanish speech rate. Um, and it became very clear to me that Manuel's family adapted uh, fairly well because I couldn't grasp what Manuel said to me. And neither um, his mother nor his sister at the time of the interview expressed any sign of confusion with the Spanish speech output. It also became very clear to me that I had not yet tinkered with my own um, listening skills to adapt to the device as seen by this clear difference between their reaction and my reaction in this situation. And so this example is also really highlighting um, something that I think is very important. Um, and that's that Gloria, despite you know, using the device every day, doesn't consider herself someone who tinkers with devices. Yet, you know, according to her, the American speech pathologist, presumably white English dominant, is qualified as an expert to tinker with the device. She suggests that maybe the speech pathologist just didn't set up Spanish language options in the app because she just um, simply didn't understand Spanish and so, didn't. And so in this situation, um, it was actually a pretty familiar one for the family um, based on their past experiences with clinicians and other professionals where they're routinely met with um, lack of Spanish language support. And so 
Bergloy Berg didn't come as a surprise that the speech pathologist overlooked this need for Spanish settings on the app. And so, um, yeah, so the speech pathologist does fall short on this crucial aspect of programming the device, um, really revealing this um, structural bias uh, against Spanish using users, as also seen in Jose's case, um, and really constraining um, how the family interacts with each other, as well as with new communication partners like myself. Um, and then in this last example on tinkering around, um, I'm gonna be talking about Alejandra and her mother, um, Gabby. So um, during our interview, um, her mother, Mother Gabby, um, she described their situation to be you know, their communication um, systems to be pretty, you know, pretty multimodal. They're, they're a pretty multimodal family is what um, she had said. Um, she showed me all of these devices at the time of our interview um, that Alejandra has been, you know, working with. And, you know, despite though this wide range of options for Alejandra, um, Alejandra was very clear during our conversation that she actually preferred what is referred to as um, low tech typing. Um, it was in our initial meeting, actually, that um, her mother had mentioned that Alejandra intensely disliked um, symbol-based AAC apps. And I was really curious um, to know more about her feelings on this topic. Um, and so it was during our interview where I asked Alejandra why she didn't like using pictures or a symbol-based AAC to communicate. And she responded with, I'm not loving pictures mainly because I am laugh out loud um, human and the letters are magical. Yeah, a really great quote. Um, but you know, Alejandra's mother appreciated the affordances of this type of um, symbol based AAC, saying that at the end of the day, it's so much easier to press a button that says, I need to go to the bathroom than typing that out. She wants to type everything with the iPad. And pressing one button would be so much easier, especially if she's having a hard time with her body. So while it may seem easier to uh, or easier to press a button, um, it's not Alejandra's preferred way to get her needs met. And so Alejandra's communication here was at the center of the, this um, conflicting goal. Um, her mother wants her to use symbol-based AAC to get her needs met faster while Alejandra favored um, the typing on a keyboard more, even if this method was a bit slower. Um, and so when I asked Alejandra what kind of AAC she, she preferred, she actually um, acknowledged this issue um, saying that, I prefer an actual keyboard, but I do use Proloquo for text because it makes me more accountable for my movements. And that's the reason I love low tech more. I often refuse to use my device, meaning her iPad um, with uh, protocol for text, um, and my family gets frustrated. And so Alejandra, like many um, autistic individuals, um, she has um, dyspraxia, which is a condition that affects both um, physical uh, coordination and motor skills. Um, so while she did have access to what is referred to generally as high tech, uh, meaning this uh, the Proloquo for text app, um, along with like other, other apps um, on her iPad, um, she preferred communicating with, with the low tech, um, meaning this, um, what she called actual keyboard, because it was more forgiving of her, mo of her movement problem, movement issues. And so Alejandra told me that uh, iPads actually make her stim. And so the, the how stimming meaning the producing of uh, repetitive movements or sounds, um, yet with the high, with using this high tech, um, it was necessary for her to like be held accountable um, for controlling movements. Um, but because an, an iPad's keyboard is a screen based rather than um, tactile, it leaves little room for, for error in the typing. Um, so one mistake in typing, again, as uh, we saw in Lil's case, um, it can create um, speech output to sound incoherent and um, creating the, the interactional difficulties. But even with symbol-based AAC um, apps on an iPad, um, precise motor skills are required. Um, for example, if you have an icon for yes and it's placed very closely to the icon for no, 
um, one slip of the finger could cause Alejandra to say something that she didn't intend to say. And so Alejandra told me that communicating in Spanish actually with her grandmother was easier for her with using uh, low tech. Um, she said, I type in Spanish easily. My communication partner can switch my iPad to Spanish very easily, but it's not an issue um, when low tech is used. Um, so um, by using this uh, low tech um, keyboard, Alejandra didn't have to rely on someone else to switch the language of the app for her. Um, she could do it herself by switching um, the language she typed in. Um, but for Alejandra, the low tech was actually a greater site of, um, like a site that was uh, of greater agency as well as control, as well as um, multilingual flexibility. Um, so in this situation, Alejandra's family are in this process of tinkering around AAC to prioritize um, the way Alejandra prefers to communicate. And so because Alejandra um, refuses to use the iPad, Alejandra's mother says, I have to remind Alejandra, like, this is all just temporary. Like, we're trying all of these systems. Eventually, you know, you're going to have to pick what's really going to be your thing. Um, so this shows that she, while well, she recognizes the affordances of experimenting with a wide range of AAC devices and encourages Alejandra um, to utilize them, she also has this um, expectation that Alejandra will have like a, a go-to thing, um, meaning a particular uh, AAC system such as a typing-based um, AAC or a preferred communication device that she'll mainly um, be using. Um, and so while her mother is showing some initial resistance and just using one system, you know, by saying, I have to remind Alejandra, this is all just temporary, um, because you know, she wants to ensure that Alejandra gives a fair chance to all of the devices available to her. Um, she's also acknowledging that there will come a day when Alejandra's communication preferences, um, whether that be you know, using the low tech typing, um, will override her own preference, which would be the um, using the iPad to communicate. Uh, and so despite having easier ways to communicate, her mother recognizes Alejandra's autonomy in her communication and is willing to tinker around and adapt to the preferred way Alejandra wants to communicate and really um, let go of the you know, imagined world of um, where Alejandra's needs would have been met um, in a way that the family might have preferred or expected. And so in conclusion, um, tinkering um, this process really generates new ways of interacting in the social world. And again, the effects of this tinkering go beyond the boundaries of the device itself such as facilitating the construction of linguistic and cultural identity through language, as seen in Colsez and Leo's case, and reconfiguring family interaction and essentially um, transforming interactional practices to make communication possible, as seen in Manuel's and Alejandra's case. And uh, by families tinkering with and tinkering around AAC devices, it really highlights the linguistic hegemony of the English language built into and around the devices, yet they're still able to develop and create ways to make it work for their multilingual environments. And so in this way, non-speakers and their families are really challenging deficit-based ideologies to broaden our understanding of what effective communication looks like and how it's achieved. And I just wanna leave you all with some questions to consider and um, reflect on based off of um, what I've presented to you all today. Um, the first one is, what does it mean for AAC technologies to be bilingual, um, multilingual? Um, maybe this means different things for different people. Um, what a tech developer who does not identify as an AAC user may think this means may be completely different from what someone who is a multilingual AAC user. Um, what does bilingual, multilingual, multi-dialectal AAC look like? Um, you know, this, it's not just about having the right vocabulary, right? Um, language is so much more than vocabulary. It's culture, it's community, it's family. Um, it's how one's socialized into the world. You know, what is, 
what is the future of AAC technology? Um, more than half of the world um, knows more than one language. So it's not so much about diversifying AAC. It's about having technology that reflects the reality and prioritizing this issue to ensure people's communication rights. Um, what can be done to avoid English language bias in AAC technologies? Um, as we saw in many of the examples, English was the linguistic default built into the design of the technology, which can be harmful because it leads to possibly missing opportunities of engaging in meaningful, culturally rich um, interactions. And lastly, um, how can these individuals and their families be best served and supported? Um, I would argue that the best way technology developers could um, best support um, these individuals and their families is to make the future of AAC a highly collaborative um, project with its multilingual users. Um, after all, communication is a collaborative effort, and so there cannot be a disconnect of what's happening on the ground and what technology developers are thinking is happening. Um, these technologies, you know, are pre-programmed and designed by people um, with their own ideologies and presumptions about um, how and who um, will be used, they will be used by. And so resulting in AAC inevitably limiting what um, non-speakers can say and physically do. And so this is a very big responsibility. So it's really important to be in constant conversation with each other to ensure that their communication rights are protected and respected. And yes, so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you again for having me. Um, if you would like to keep the conversation going, um, my email is um, written right there. It's ericaprado at uchicago.edu. Um, I also um, am highly encourage anyone <laughs> who would like to um, chat with me about um, any of this. Also my um, publication, uh, if you would like a copy, um, as well as, you know, keeping um, conversations. Um, yeah, so no, no other questions, awesome. Um, but yeah, so also I have a, a shorter script of the presentation if anyone would like to see that, um, as well as just any, any and all, of, um, I'm very happy to, to chat. Thank you so much, Erica, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, I, and I'll reiterate from Christina, those are really great quotes that you uh, put into there. Yay. I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay. So uh, Eric, I know you've got your information here. Please reach out to Erica should you have any more. Thank you everyone and thank you, Erica. Thank you so much.